head in two directions. First, I want to present a portrait of two people, Rami Rao, a fellow high school student, and Mr. Jones, a high school English teacher. And implicit in these remarks, you'll see something about the kind of student I was. And you'll see why I constantly um, appreciate and almost worship the work that you do here. Um, I was not the best of high school students. Um, and then these, these remarks fall out of an event in one of my classes. Um, the memory of the class will comment on at the end. Rami Rao. I don't know what other students at Top Camp High School in Linden Hills, California thought of Rami Rao. He was certainly not the most popular person on campus. He didn't play a varsity sport, nor was he on the yell leading squad. He didn't hold an office on student council. Unlike Gerald Lieberman or Ian Pelkey, he was not known for his wealth or cars. Rami was not my friend. I can say with certainty that he doesn't remember me and that he never has remembered me. He barely knew me. I doubt that he even knew my name. I took one class with him and saw him very seldom otherwise. My high school, TAP, grades 10 through 12 in the suburb of um, the San Fernando Valley in California, just north of Los Angeles, had over 3,000 students, and when we entered new classrooms at the beginning of each term, we didn't even recognize many of the students sitting there. Our friends were mostly kids we had already made friends with in middle school, or students we spent time with in clubs or on sports teams. Though I didn't make many friends in classes, I might have sought out Rami Rami as a friend if having him as a friend had ever, ever entered my head, um, but it hadn't. And still, for years, something about him captivated me. Rami lived what was for me an unattainable life. But more than this, the time Rami Rao took custody of Mr. Jones' junior English class was one of the most extraordinary moments in my classroom experience at Taft High. Mr. Jones taught us in a bungalow. Um, beginning in the early 60s, a student enrollment at Taft got through the physical plan, and so they offloaded the big bungalows onto a large parking lot in front of the school. The parking lot was about the size of our sports field. And when I took Mr. Jones's class, um, they covered about half of the lot. And um, I don't remember ever seeing Rami around school, but I did occasionally see him in the parking lot next to Mr. Jones' bungalow. He drove to school in a red MG convertible with a black canvas top and black interior. There were students at TAP in fancier cars, but Rami's was among the most terrible. And Rami came from old money, at least I thought he did. I several times overheard him speaking about places he had visited, or I thought I heard him overheard him speaking about Europe, the Middle East, the Far East, and even Texas. Places he to me only through magazines and TV. He would sometimes create his own long weekend flying to Northern California, driving with friends to Las Vegas. Even more remarkable were his frequent more mundane weekends with friends in a bachelor pad on the coast at Malibu. Let me summarize what I've thus far said using the most appropriate language I can think of. Mommy always longed to go in on you, Dimanche. <laughs> Mountains and sometimes down to the beach and occasionally out to the desert in Valencia. 
but we were not about to ride our 10 speeds to Europe or India, and we never even rode to Texas, which was a state with its own exotic tour. I was therefore amazed on several occasions when I noticed Rami sitting on the hood of his car, quietly discoursing with a small circle of students about his road and air voyages. He did this with a look of casual, almost careless reverie. It seemed that Rami was looking at lands far away on this throne, which he could only imagine, which we could only imagine. Rami was not condescending. As far as I could tell, he treated everyone equally. His equanimity might have come from his Indian background, though he seemed more American than anything else. His smooth, quiet English was as Californian as anyone's. And almost against reason, he did not seem to have favorites among TAF students. He seemed above favorite. I was not aware of his having any close friend. But again, he wasn't condescending. He was aloof, but um, he was kindly aloof. I mentioned earlier that to me, Rami lived what I thought was an unattainable life. In my imagination, his exotic travels, including complex, worldly friends, beautiful buildings and landscapes, and multiple languages. Still, this was not the limit of Rami's eminence. There was more to him than even my imagined glamorous flourishes. Um, he was a reader, and though he didn't speak much in class, when he did, he entered into amazing conversations with Jones. He seemed to easily, naturally absorb the literature that we read in, in our courses in, in that class without any need to show off to Mr. Jones or to the rest of us. All he did seemed out of a sophistication that was far beyond um, anything I had seen as a student. And this, it turned out, was really my reason for supposing that he had lived such an exotic life. I really didn't know. Really. I never talked to him. I didn't know if he went to Europe, really. So I was supposed. And then one day in English class, he rose above us as an adult and he showed himself to be a kind of genius. The most important academic occasion of each semester at Taft High was the day of course registration. All juniors and seniors filled into a large file into a large assembly room where each department had brown class cards which we collected and filled in and then handed to Mrs. Metzger, who made certain that we had adequate course loads. My advisor, Coach Furlong, had been a professional basketball player, um, and he was a good coach, and he was a perfect <coughs> advisor for me because he realized that basketball required immediate attention and commitment. Um, he realized that, but he also realized that hard classes could always be postponed <laughs> Coach Furlong was, so he was one half of my curricular good, good luck, my curricular good fortune. The other half was my own physical speed and mental dexterity during course registrations. Choosing the right teachers required careful consideration. For instance, I knew enough to stay away from Mrs. Van Kemp in science and Mr. Armijo in history, both of whom expected far too much from their students. And naturally, if one were to build a sufficient, sufficiently easy class schedule, one needed to move from table to pay, table ahead of the many other students who were like-minded. Um, quick judgment and foot speed were essential, as the right classes tended to fill up, tended to fill up pretty quickly with that. While registering for my junior year classes, I ran into Patty Noble, who, according to my friend, um, Steve Grossman, wrote her first name P-A-T-T, -T, followed by an I, over which she wrote a heart, which is what we had what the English class called a decorative affectation. <laughs> um, so, Patty Noble. We were standing in front of the English department table, and Patty with an eye assured me that Mr. Jones was a great teacher. The adjective great by itself can be vague, but in Patty's mouth, it was music. Patty, judging from my friend Steve Grossman's advice, um, was more socialized than a scholar, meaning that Mr. Jones' classes were easy and effortless. Um, and you don't have to work hard to get it to be in. So I really had no choice. Um, so I grabbed a card from, from Mr. Jones and ran to the home ec table to grab another card from Mrs. Ensign, which was another piece of great. I completely misjudged Patty. Uh, it turned out
turned out that she spelled, she spelled her name P-A-T-T -T with a Y, not an I, <laughs> and that she was not a socialite. In fact, she was a good student, one of the many good female students at my school. Steve's advice about her affectation of spelling her name was a little more than a symptom of his desire to date her. Um, <laughs> thus, when she told me that Mr. Jones was a great teacher, she meant the wrong thing. What? She meant that he was serious and demanding, and most of the two qualities I was attempting to avoid. <laughs> Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones turned out to be one of the few English teachers at Taft High who made me read books. He was an unusually casual man, what we later call cool. Middle-aged, with moderate light and build, with thin, nearly shoulder-like hair, he drove a yellow hardtop Corvette. His shirts, pants, and sweaters were mostly pastel. His footwear included patterned socks and loafers. He was divorced, and one day he casually told us in a novel he was writing about a man who, he said, finds his life meaningless. A man about, talking about his age finds his life meaningless and applies to this unendurable circumstance the only desperate remedies men in our culture know. The only remedies he knows are sex, material goods, and alcohol. Now, this thumbnail description of a meaningless life didn't appear quite so meaningless um, to us. The idea of the novel dressed in the sex part was much more appealing than um, anything I'd read in Mrs. Wilson's 10th grade English <laughs> But for Mr. Jones, we did read, among other novels and stories, in heavy way, short story, The Old Man at the Bridge. Does anyone know that story, The Old Man at the Bridge? Thank <laughs> you. 
action in next passage is luscious. <laughs> um, our track coach, we called him Black Jack McCaffrey. The word was that he would lynch students if they so much looked and looked at him cross eyed. And I didn't know of any CAP teachers who would allow any students to mimic them. Um, stress it to their face. Um, <coughs> the body gesture in the word luscious, it seemed that Rama was racing right through some kind of no man's land. Uh, and this was really, this was really audacious. And it was exposure. Mr. Jones would have known what we thought of him and how <coughs> we thought he was. Uh, how did he stand that? And then Mr. Jones laughed. And then we considered laughing. And then he told Rami to continue. Giants. This memory does raise some questions. Why has this episode remained to be more remarkable than Nick Sanchez and Jeff Cicada's pole vaulting, or Bob Bowen's 100 yard dash in the league finals, or Woody Beerkamp's batting in center fielding, or Bruce Bender's Porsche rides? In the neighborhood, or Dale Hudson's heroic act of riding his Honda motorcycle at 60 miles an hour all the way down Malibu Canyon on the dotted median line between cars. Um, why is that memory of Rami more salient to me than, um, than the memory of, of those others? How did Rami know that Mr. Jones could take this kind of joke? Our gasping laughter suggested that many of us were convinced that Mr. Jones took himself seriously enough to be embarrassed at being made fun of. What struck me later was that even though I did not fully understand this at the time, Rami's larger view of Mr. Jones had impressed me. He saw that Mr. Jones could make light of himself, and, and more importantly, Rami was able to publicly appreciate the ways in which Mr. Jones' idiosyncrasies were at peace with his teaching. One of the things you like about Rami's thing. Rami's humor depended on the seriousness of Mr. Jones' class. Without that, there would never have been the tension that made Rami's ludicrous mimicry so embarrassingly funny. Rami had somehow revealed that the state of Mr. Jones' class was something that allowed for genuine side-splitting humor. After the Emperor Alexander had conquered virtually the entire known world and was conquering at least the world known Greece and was conquering countries even outside of his own known world, east into India, um, Alexander, as some of you know, was called home because of political problems. Before he left the outermost fringe of his greatly expanded empire, he had his troops build a giant room, something like this, but he had he had the troops build this giant room, and in the room he put giant furniture. So he had chairs that were about this high, and huge tables. And then he had them just scatter these huge pieces of furniture around the room. And his intention was that any potential invaders coming from the east would believe that the Greeks who had abandoned their outposts were in fact giants. Now I wonder if my memory of Rami, which I've had to reconstruct from memories of events long past is in some way like that giant room of Alexander's. Though Rami was most likely a fairly ordinary adolescent, though my memories of his life are likely those of a larger figure than he was, my recollection of his day in Mr. Jones' classroom makes him something larger than life. The same might be said of Mr. Jones. The manner in which I remember them and the place they have taken in my own teaching has fixed them before my imagination as giants. Ron's complexity and imagination, his understanding of Mr. Jones, and my growing sense and appreciation of Mr. Jones' teaching, and how that made possible Ronnie's humor, have made of them, for me, giants. Um, giants partially of my own creation, um, but giants nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs>